on that note, I would now like to turn to my third and final episode. And here I want to specifically contemplate Alexander Hamilton's legal legacy, how he is remembered after his death by practicing lawyers and judges in the 19th century. I think and hope it will surprise you to say that Alexander Hamilton developed a reputation as an advocate for state power, an advocate for state sovereignty. Now, how did that happen? Well, it all has to do with something called Hamiltonian concurrence. And before I describe what that is, I just want to do a little bit of definitional work here. This is what I do with my students, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, first definition is federalism. Federalism, as I'm sure you know, is the word we use to refer to the relationship between the national governments and the state governments. Who has what power? What power is divided between them? What power is shared? Federalism is, in my opinion, the most important question in American constitutional law, and it'll never be solved because the states and the federal government will always exist in tension under our constitution. The second definition is concurrent power. Now, concurrent power is the idea that even though you have a national government and a state government, and sometimes they're in tension, there are many instances when they can simultaneously and harmoniously exercise the very same power at the same time. Example. This is Hamilton's best example. On April 15th of this year, everybody in this room is going to submit a tax return to the IRS, so to the federal government and to the, to the state government. For me, that'll be Kentucky. And that will be a great example of a concurrent power of taxation because simultaneously and harmoniously, both sovereigns, both levels of government are exercising their power to tax on you and me. So Hamilton writes one of his Federalist essays, it's Federalist number 32, and he writes this essay all about federalism and concurrent power. And it's all about the power to tax. He's writing it, remember, for an audience of skeptical New Yorkers who don't want the Constitution to be ratified or they're really unsure about the Constitution. And so in Federal 32, what Hamilton argues to these skeptical New Yorkers is that you shouldn't worry about state power under this new Constitution. Because whenever a question of federalism pops up, Hamilton says in Federal 32, you begin from the premise that states retain all of their pre-existing sovereignty, all of the power they had before. Now let me pause on that for just a second because that's a tremendous amount of power. Recall in the 1780s how the Articles of Confederation are so weak because the states have all the sovereignty and that created so many problems that 55 delegates had to meet in Philadelphia to sort that out. And here Hamilton is arguing in Federal 32 that that's where you begin, from the assumption that states retain all of that power. But of course, we have a constitution now, or we will soon have one. So states can't have all of that power at all times under the constitution. So when is it limited? And Hamilton says in three different cases would state sovereignty be limited. The first case, when the Constitution specifically grants an exclusive power to the federal government. Example, the power to make a treaty with the foreign nation. States aren't responsible for that anymore. Hamilton goes on to say, okay, remember the premise is states retain their pre-existing sovereignty unless exception two, where the US Constitution specifically prohibits the states from doing something. And 
for that, all you have to do is turn to Article 1, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution, and you will see this laundry list of things that states can no longer do. Things like you cannot, states can no longer impair the obligation of a contract, for example. But Hamilton's third exception, so the third case in which state sovereignty would be limited, is the fun one. It's the one all the lawyers love because it's, it has, it's based on the situational context. Hamilton says, there will be cases when, generally speaking, the federal government is empowered to act and states can usually act as well. But under that particular circumstance, the result would be contradictory and repugnant to the Constitution. And when that happens, the states have to back off and they can't act. Now, in Hamilton's lifetime, he doesn't really have much opportunity of explaining what he means by contradictory or repugnant. And you can just imagine how you could apply that test to all sorts of different scenarios. And that is exactly what happens after Hamilton's death. Because Federalist 32 is cited all over the place in state court and in federal court in the 19th century. Because as more and more questions of federalism pop up, Hamilton and Hamiltonian concurrence becomes the sort of guide for judges and lawyers to use. So I want to walk you through a case. And this case is one of my favorite cases uh, to teach. I'm sure you'll recognize it. It's the case of McCulloch versus Maryland. And what I'll do is I'll first talk about the facts of the case, and then we'll talk about the law and where Hamilton's legal theory comes into play. So, this will exemplify how lawyers are using Hamiltonian concurrence. Okay, so McCulloch versus Maryland, here are the facts. It's all about the second bank of the United States. Now, I know you will remember that Alexander Hamilton, when he, back in the early 1790s, when he's imagining his uh, economic plan to restore our public credit worthiness, part of the plan is to set up a central bank. And there's questions about whether or not the Constitution will authorize Congress to set up a national bank. And Washington is conflicted enough to ask his advisors, Jefferson and Hamilton, to write opinions on the matter. And Hamilton, of course, comes up with an opinion that says Congress can create a bank. And Washington agrees. And the first bank of the United States comes into existence. But by its charter, the First Bank of the United States would only be around and operating for 20 years unless Congress renewed its charter. So 1811, 20 years later, comes and goes, and Congress declines to recharter the bank, and it closes its doors. Okay, well then what happens? Well, we fight another war with Great Britain. And on the flip side of the war, President Madison and his Congress think, you know, it would have been really nice to have a central bank to help us finance that. So maybe we should recharter Hamilton's central bank. And so the second bank of the United States is rechartered in 1816. At the same time, the state of Maryland is recovering from the War of 1812, and they're looking for uh, ways to raise revenue. And so they decide to tax, put, place a tax, on foreign corporations doing business in the state as banks. Now, what that means, a foreign corporation only means a business doing business in Maryland, a corporation doing business in Maryland that wasn't chartered by Maryland. And it just so happens that the only foreign corporation doing business in 1817 in Maryland that's a bank is the Baltimore branch of the Second Bank of the United States. So Maryland wants to tax the Baltimore branch, and the bank manager, a guy named James McCulloch, says nope. And litigation ensues all the way up through the Maryland state courts, where Maryland affirms over and over and over again that states have the, the power, the sovereignty, to tax foreign corporations, so the Bank of the United States, you have to pay. And so finally, the case on a writ of error review goes up to the US Supreme Court where Chief Justice uh, John Marshall is presiding, and the case will be decided in the US Supreme Court in 1819. So, 
there's two legal questions before the court. First question, is the Bank of the United States constitutional? This question Hamilton already answered, but only to George Washington. The question didn't go before a court. So this is the Supreme Court's first time really litigating this question. And the second question is the one that's more important for us today. The second question is, can the state of Maryland tax the bank? Well, we're not gonna be surprised to learn that the lawyers for the bank, for McCulloch, use Alexander Hamilton's legal arguments all over the place because he is the guy who wrote this wonderful, long, but wonderful treatise about why the first bank of the United States is constitutional. And so they cite his necessary and proper arguments. They're citing his Article 1, Section 8 arguments. And then they say, and because this is a creation of Congress, states can't tax it. Congress is supreme. But I hope it's surprising to you, it certainly was surprising to me, to learn that the lawyers for the state of Maryland rely on Alexander Hamilton's legal arguments even more. And what they're using is Federalist 32. Because what they argue is that none other than Alexander Hamilton has given us this clear picture into questions of federalism. States retain their pre-existing sovereignty. That is what he tells us. And what's his example that he uses? The power to tax, which is exactly what we're talking about here. States have the power to tax. Foreign corporations, we've always done it, we can do it now, it doesn't violate any of his exceptions, boom, we can ask Maryland, uh, Baltimore branch to pay this tax. So John Marshall, who of course is an admirer of Hamilton and a longtime Federalist, he has to decide between Hamilton, the advocate of Congress and congressional power, and Hamilton, the advocate of state power. And what is he gonna do? Well, he sides with Hamilton, the advocate of congressional power. And he argues that one, to the first legal question, of course the bank is constitutional, Hamilton got that right, right off the bat. But on the second trickier question about state sovereignty and the power to tax, Marshall says that this is one of those situations that's contradictory and repugnant to the Constitution. Why? Because Congress can, can charter this bank. The bank exists and it should exist. It's constitutional. And usually the states can tax foreign corporations. But famously, because the power to tax is the power to destroy, the states can effectively curb Congress from exercising its constitutional authority, and that is contradictory and repugnant to the Constitution. So, I love teaching McCulloch versus Maryland because it's a great case, and because it's such a good case to demonstrate the impact of Alexander Hamilton's influence over law, right? You can't talk about this case without talking about Hamilton. And the lawyers couldn't make their case without using Hamilton. So McCulloch versus Maryland demonstrates how Hamilton had a long lasting impact on the important questions of American federalism, just like he had such an important impact on rights and liberties for New Yorkers, as well as executive power under our new constitution. I hope I've persuaded you that Hamilton had a profound influence over American law, and I really look forward to your questions. Thanks for being here today, everybody. I appreciate it. All right.